Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I am paying a visit to the Star Wars universe. Kind of appropriate because, of course, Star Wars is back at the top of the movie charts. Yes, we have X-Wings flying around, and everybody wants to go back and fly X-Wings, and thanks to good old games, and of course, the classic X-Wing simulator games, you can in fact do this. So I thought I'd go back and take a look at this very important series in the spaceflight combat sim genre, X-Wing Simulator. Now you'll notice it doesn't actually say X-Wing Simulator. When the game was launched, all the advertising material said X-Wing Simulator. It was a harder game for a more civilized era, a time when games could afford to be difficult and complicated. In fact, one of the most complicated things was getting this thing running under DOS. But anyway, the mission, you would have everything set up, you would have quite complicated missions, and it would be explained ahead of time by uh, get this guy, I think this is General Dodonna here, he is tr doing the training missions, there would be six training missions for each spacecraft. Also, interestingly, you could assign your other characters, if you had other save files, you could assign them to the other wingmen, and that would be very useful because sometimes your other pilots with sufficiently high scores would be better NPCs. Of course, uh, this was uh, 1993, the, you know, the standard at the time was Wing Commander, so you had all these nice transition scenes. Amazing what they were able to do. They had to fit all this onto floppy disks, so they couldn't just do FMV, they had to carefully do sprites. But the game itself used flat shaded 3D polygons. And I guess in the PC land where Wing Commander was the standard and Wing Commander was using scaled sprites for all their spacecraft, that was quite a novel thing. But and, and, and it was novel enough that a number of journalists recently, when the GOG version was re-released, claimed that this was the first PC game to do this, which is a bunch of bogus crap and they should become better journalists by actually learning their history. Regardless, no, th this game used these very simple flat shaded models uh, of these iconic spacecraft, so you kind of had a great reference point. Now, it is pretty hard. I'm just flying around here. It has a, you know, you've got to really uh, manage your power here. This is probably the first game that I know of that had the, the three-way power management where you could assign power to your engines, laser or weapons, and shields. You also had the ability to quickly shift power between your lasers and your shield batteries if you needed to very quickly recharge one or the other. It also has a, you know, enhanced controls for the weapon system. So I'm firing these weapons one laser at a time, and that's nice if you want to kind of fire at a higher rate. But uh, the targeting system also has a predictive targeting uh, mechanism. So. If you put the sight in the right place, it will turn green, indicating your weapons will hit it. And if I link my weapons together, this is a better way, in theory, this is the way I would always play. I would link my weapons together, wait for a green targeting signal, and then shoot it. If you held the trigger down, you would not see the green targeting signal. There we go. Excellent, you see? That's how I used to fly the game, uh, fly the fighters. So, uh, yeah, you know, this introduced the, the power management system that we see in many spacecraft today, or spaceship games today. It also introduced uh, the targeting mechanics that we see in a lot of space sims. You know, you have target nearest hostile, target thing in front of you, target the, <laughs> the cycle through list of targets, all these things, all that kind of management. This was probably one of the first games to really do it well, and I'm sure there are PC games that did it first, but again, this was really defining a lot of the, the genre. Its main competition at this time was Wing Commander, which had been a huge success. So, you know, this was kind of the next step along the evolution of PC spaceship games, and many of the things it features in this pretty much still exist in modern games unchanged. E Elite Dangerous and Star Citizen both use the kind of shield and power management features that are in X-Wing. This all actually also features um, 
fore and aft shields, which of course, the reason it features this is because the movie has references to it. You know, they're flying down the, the trench and they're like, wait, the guns, they've stopped. Stabilize your rear deflectors. Watch for enemy fighters. So of course they needed to have that in there. They needed to have like, oh right, you know, we're, R2, can you give us a little more power? Sure, yeah, we you know, recycle or adjust the power flow and everything. So all these things appeared in the movie, therefore they had to be in the game. They talk about proton torpedoes, they talk about concussion missiles. We see a bunch of different spacecraft. So all of these ended up being in the game. And they, of course, had to give them reasons to exist. You know, why would you have these Y-wings when they're crap and they're slow? Well, the reason you have Y-wings is because they have ion cannons. And there's a number of missions where you need to shoot things with ion cannons. What are ion cannons? Well, they can disable targets without destroying them, as we saw in Empire Strikes Back, right? It's really, you know, interesting to see how the game tried to take as much from Star Wars as it could, while still also being a good game. Also, you know, another thing worth commenting on is when this was released. This was 1993, right? There hadn't been the prequels, obviously, there hadn't been the special editions. The this movie series existed in a kind of, a level of maturity which hadn't, doesn't really exist anymore because there's far too many kids that like it, right? So this was like, the people that had loved Star Wars, they'd grown up a bit, they'd learned how to use their computers, and so the quality of the game they demanded was a more, you know, high-tech experience. So yeah, here we go here, I'm just showing you the, the graphics of this. This is exterior view. I've shot all the bad guys. Now from inside, there's like flat shaded, uh, or you know, flat pieces of artwork that, to show the cockpit from all sorts of directions. You see that? Very nice rendition of the X-Wing cockpit. And we can see it from the outside. Again, the, the polygons are all flat shaded. There's nothing, there's no texture mapping or anything. But we do have animation on the S-foils as they close and we enter hyperspace to signify completing the mission. And off we go. Now, 1993 was also around the time when uh, computers were becoming much more capable and they started to include CD-ROMs. Of course, again, you had to be a super elite DOS hacker to actually make your CD-ROM work reliably. But that's okay because the kind of people that are super elite, you know, DOS hackers were also into spaceship games. And so inevitably, X-Wing Simulator was released as a collector's CD-ROM edition. Now this was actually built on the TIE Fighter engine. TIE Fighter was the sequel to X-Wing Simulator and it is a, a superior game in almost every way. But it does actually pro offer uh, a number of improvements that makes it worthwhile. We still have these nice transitions. Having all that extra CD-ROM space to play with meant that we could actually include uh, some voiceover work. And we get Eric Bursfeld, the actual voice of Admiral Akbar, returns to reprise his role in the game. Your mission is to be the advance scout for this capture operation. That is the real Akbar. A shuttle has been dispatched to repair and capture the freighter. Be on the lookout for pirates as well as the Empire in this sector. Yeah, I hear that he is actually in The Force Awakens, again, playing the same character, so that's another nice link to the past. We, of course, have another launch animation. This is the A-Wing we are flying this time. So, the A-Wing in the X-Wing games is basically faster than any other Rebel ship, right? It's designed to be fast, it's designed to be an interceptor, it's the only one that carries concussion missiles instead of proton torpedoes. Concussion missiles are actually, you know, guided seeking missiles here. Now you can immediately see as we warped in that the graphics are slightly better here. Now, the graphics uh, on these things, there, there's a bit of a... There's a bit of Gurad shading going on there. That means that the flat surfaces are less flat now because what they're doing is they're computing the shading between the different normals at different points on, on the... Um, on the Oh, they, they basically compute different shading for different points on the thing and it's, it's a complicated process to do with calculating normals at the vertices and then averaging your thing and 
computer graphics people know what I'm talking about. Anyway, look, we're waiting for bad guys to show up, and here we have Y-Wing Alpha 1. We know they're bad guys because it says Alpha. And I'm just going to try and use a concussion missile here. There we go, we got good tone, and we get missiles coming in. Now I'm going to try and shoot this guy. We have another couple of Y-Wings here. Okay, so X-Wing Simulator had been developed, or was developed, by Lawrence Holland. Mainly, he was kind of one of the lead designers on it. Prior to this, he had been working for LucasArts under contract, creating thing, uh, World War II sims. He'd done Battlehawks 1942, Their Finest Hour, and Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe. And then the Star Wars license essentially reverted to Lucasfilm, and they were like... Hey, let's see what this, uh, you know, flight sim guy can do with the Star Wars license. And this is what they came up with. And it was, again, I've got to point out, this was really originally pitched as a simulation. The first ad I saw for this was at the on, in the back of the first, uh, you know, really big expanded universe novel, um, Heir to the Empire. I, I found that on hardcover at my local comic store and I instantly bought it. And I then saw this ad at the back and I was like, oh, wow, this is not going to run in my Atari ST, is it? But I did eventually get it and I played it to death. Then I got the mission disc, Imperial Pursuit, played that to death. And then I got the expansion, B-Wing, which let, of course, let you fly the mighty B-Wing and of course fly a bunch more missions. It was great and I loved it. And it was not an easy game. In fact, it was one of the hardest games. It's not that the bad guys are particularly tough. What is particularly hard is that many of the mission's success hinges on other NPC spacecraft doing their job while you protect them. There are many, many escort missions in the game. But on top of that, you would sometimes play for several, you know, play for like 20 plus minutes before getting, oh, getting to the end and then realizing that some critical ship had died. There wasn't great feedback to let you know that things were going south. Uh, and yeah, speaking of going south, my cockpit has taken some critical damage. Your spacecraft can actually take damage. The cockpit instruments will get blown out and to show that things are going wrong and you have to rely, you have to fly it without their, their being available. Individual systems can also be damaged as well and the R2 unit will try to fix those. Uh, it can be particularly critical when time is ticking down and perhaps your laser system is out of commission or your shields or something else. So, uh, yeah, there is a bit of uh, management going on there. Yeah, this was not a simple game. It was a very complicated game marketed as a simulation, although obviously nowadays things like Elite Dangerous is more complicated still uh, and Star Citizen presumably will get to that level if they are given enough time. And of course, Rogue System. Oh, well, okay, never mind, Rogue System. Yes, I got shot down and I ejected safely. But in this case, I'm okay. Sometimes you'll eject and be uh, captured by the enemy, which pretty much spells the end of your game. Or you can uh, be just straight up killed, and then you end up becoming a casket that falls into the atmosphere. Yes, arriving at the medical fleet, the Salvation. And uh, going for a bath in a Bacta tank while a medical droid oversees me so I can get back on the front line and continue my mission to bring freedom to the galaxy. While I shall continue my mission to the final version of X-Wing that was made available. This is the Windows 9, or sorry, it's the 98 edition, which is based on the X-Wing versus TIE Fighter e engine. And it upgrades the resolution quite a bit to something like 800 by 600. Laughably low resolution, of course, at, by today's standards. But, yes, it does look a whole lot crisper than what we've had. Now, the 98 version is probably the easiest version for most people to play because it uses all the Windows bindings so you can actually set up a joystick like the X52. Uh, it has a much better looking you know, concourse here. You can actually see a number of familiar looking characters down there. I can see Yoda and Chewbacca. Actually, I can see someone that looks like Yoda. I can also see E.T. there. I'm not sure what he's doing there. Or she, because did we ever figure out if E.T. was a he or a she? Doesn't matter. It's an it. 
or an et. An ET, an et, an IT, an a right. Delegation to the Alliance is under Imperial attack. So uh, yeah, another voice that comes back is Clive Revel. Now Clive Revel actually played Emperor Palpatine in Empire Strikes Back. He was obviously replaced by the time Return of the Jedi came around. The only downside is, of course, if you looked at his face, it was horribly uh, mushy just because they had scaled up the graphics. But yeah, everything else looks great. Look, there's a Star Destroyer with texture mapping all over it. Of course, uh, texture mapping from 1998. Yes, different. It was a different era. And we have a bunch of things to shoot here. And my hyperdrive system got damaged right away. Great. That is some really amateurish stuff. Now, I'm flying the Y-Wing here. Y-Wing, of course, uh, you know, heavier. It doesn't quite have the firepower of the X-Wing, but it does have ion cannons, which are completely useless when dealing with these TIE bombers. Uh, I'm not sure why this is. they decided to deploy these against TIE bombers, because, frankly, I think the X-Wings would be better, but never mind. Surely the best thing to deploy against bombers is interceptors, like A-wings? Uh, yeah, never mind. Okay, so anyway, the 1998 version is, you know, native to Windows. Obviously, the GOG people have done their work to make sure that it actually works, which is not a trivial matter in some of these cases. Uh, the, it natively supports the joystick, so you can actually bind all the key bindings to, you know, my, in my case, the X52. Previous games, you can kind of bind things, but it's really complicated. You have to use a profile editor, and it generally just is, is hard, so I prefer to end up using joystick and keyboard. Uh, the responsiveness is a little hard, because there's no way to adjust the curves. But regardless, you know, it, it is easier in many, many ways. But many X-Wing purists will tell you that the 1994 CD-ROM edition is the definitive version. You should ignore this version. Uh, the reason primarily is the music system is pure Red Book audio. That's basically it was playing the John Williams soundtrack from a CD, which is fabulous if that's what you're looking for. But the iMuse system, which was in the game, and these guys are really far away, the iMuse system in the original game used MIDI, you know, you know, computer synthesized music, but it would react. When a Star Destroyer warped in, hyperdrived in, it would play a little snippet of the Imperial March and we'd be like, oh, here they come, right? So we're chasing after these guys now. So what I'm doing is diverting power away from my uh, engine, well, from shields to my engines. Taking a look around the Y-Wing here, looking pretty good. You can admire it from the outside. Yes, full power to the engines as we try to get to these targets. Getting in range! Come on, I need that missile lock before these bombers attack the Corvette. Tone is hot, pair of torpedoes away! Now, we've got TIE Bomber Alpha 3, Alpha 2, Alpha 2. Again, get a tone, get a lock on. We have heat-seeking missiles in this game, which were never officially part of the Star Wars universe until I think... Uh, I guess the first heat-seeking missiles I saw were in Attack of the Clones. So they're maybe not heat-seeking, guided missiles. There we go, we have saved the Corvette. Now it's also worth mentioning that we do have the B-Wing in this game, and one of its training missions is what would happen if you tried to fly a B-Wing in the Death Star attack? And, well, yes, this is me flying the Death Star attack mission. It is actually in it. The game takes place roughly around the time of A New Hope, so you get to uh, play through, essentially, the background missions behind A New Hope, stealing the Death Star plans and uh, ultimately attacking the, the Death Star. You know, you get to interfere with this construction. Imperial Pursuit deals with moving the rebel base to the Hoth system, and I think the B-Wing simulator adds a few more missions along those lines. There was apparently going to be a sixth mission disc, and there was room for it in the, the core game, but it never was released. Instead, we got TIE Fighter, which, as I've said, in many ways is probably a superior game, 
But if you wanted to get up close and personal with the Imperials in X-Wing Simulator, it was actually possible under the wrong circumstances. There's the Rebel! Bring him in! Like, I like the way that just comes up and it kind of eats him. And of course takes him to the Executor. Also note the Interdictor down there, which uh, isn't in the X-Wing games, but does turn up in the sequels. And here's Darth Vader, voiced by someone that isn't James Earl Jones. Maybe next time, because I gotta get out of here. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>